Investment History and Public Service at NYU. Uh, today, August 30th, 2018, here in New York, and I have the honor and privilege to be interviewing Bob Schmidt for the Richard Nixon Library Video Vault Program. Bob, it's finally a pleasure to be able to do this. Pleasure for me as well. I had clerked for a federal judge in Baltimore, very eminent federal judge, Judge Harvey, district judge. I grew up in the Washington area, but I wanted to be what I thought to be a real lawyer, which I considered to be involved in solving problems and working for clients, uh, not the usual administrative work that maybe a Washington lawyer does. It's good work, but it just wasn't for me. Um, so I clerked for Judge Harvey and um, then went into the military briefly and the Army Reserves, did basic training at Fort Leonard Wood, not one of the most pleasant experiences of my life. And I came back to work um, for the Venable Law Firm, which is one of the premier law firms in Baltimore. And I had started there in October of 19... 67 and had fortunately fallen under the tutelage and mentorship of a great lawyer and human being, uh, Dick Emery. And in those days, um, the way law practice and big firms went is you had a mentor or a uh, rabbi, you might say, that you worked for. And uh, normally you would rotate it around, but I stayed with Dick my entire period of time and uh, became a partner January 1, 1973, which in the scale of things in this firm was a rather m rapid promotion. And I had um, been doing my best to establish myself with various clients of the firm uh, for the prior year, uh, and that's what I was doing in January 1974. Um, did Mr. Doerr call you and ask you to join the staff? I got a call very early in the morning, January 1, I believe, 1974. I believe it was uh, New Year's Day, I believe it could have been seven in the morning. And my phone rang, actually it wasn't my residence, it was a companion of mine. And the phone rang about seven or thereabouts. And it was my sister Dorothy. And um, I knew she had been asked to work for John been very close to John in the Civil Rights Division. And she simply said, Bob, Mr. Doerr would like you to come to work for him. The impeachment inquiry, in effect, as the uh, director of operations or the administrative part of it. So I was somewhat annoyed, having been awakened at that hour on New Year's Day. So I said, Dorothy, I'll think about it. So I slammed the phone down and um, the phone rang again in about three or four minutes, maybe five. Very soon she says, Bob, this is Dorothy again. Mr. Dorr insists. So I thought for a moment I wasn't very happy about leaving my position at Venable because I'd been working hard to uh, get myself established as a young partner. But um, I said, fine, I'll do it. Um, so, and by Dorothy, we're Dorothy Lester. Correct. Uh, so you 
accept this, and uh, you are among the very first members of his team. I would say uh, that's correct. I think David Haynes was there, and I don't think much of anybody else was there. Dick Cates was there, but he'd come before John. Um, tell us uh, what your duties were in that first month or so. Well, let me set a little background for you uh, as to my background that equipped me for this job. I had um, actually begun in my college years had been working for a nonprofit called the Institute for Defense Analyses, which had Defense Department contracts, one of which was the Advanced Research Project Agency in the Pentagon. And Ida, as it was called, the division that I was working for, it was a summer job, was having a summer study in Newport, Rhode Island at the Naval War College. And although it was a bit unusual, I was asked to be the administrative officer on site for this summer study. And the study was basically the participants were very highly um, regarded academics, uh, various institutions who we collect in a period of time for a month to do a study for ARPA. And one of the appeals was that they would bring their families. So the procedure was is that um, a couple dozen of these academics and their families would be together for a month at the Naval War College. And I was selected to be the administrator on site uh, to run the study. And that involved um, very stringent um, security procedures. I had a top secret clearance, all the rest of them did. And we really adhered to the protocols of a um, intelligence agency in terms of uh, security and operations. And I was also very familiar with the structure of running a study or a project. Um, I worked for a very interesting man. He was a Navy Mustang, which is, he was, came up from the ranks, but he was a commander, retired commander. Um, very talented administrator. He had everything set up for me um, in terms of personnel and processes, but I had, uh, in effect, a document control clerk. We had secretaries, and I had a lead secretary. Uh, so I was quite familiar with the kind of structure that would be needed to run it administratively, a project. And I think that's what Dorothy had told John, that not many lawyers had had that experience. And I did three or four of those in my law school years in Newport, and a couple actually in San Diego, California. So when um, I showed up, my understanding was is that I would do whatever was required to run a project. And so I immediately discovered that there was some existing talent. First of all, there were about a dozen clerks that were on hand, not clear what they were meant to be doing. Uh, Jeff Bonchero was one of them who you've talked to who'd been hired for various purposes. I think they were all political patronage, but they were bright, attractive young people, all college graduates. So there were about a dozen of those on hand, but also there was a very remarkable woman by the name of Janet Howard, who I'd like to emphasize because she's somebody who's existed in complete anonymity, and she's very important in terms of how this project uh, worked. She was a friend of Lois DeAndre's, who was Rodino's kind of uh, protege and assistant. And I think it initially been thought that Lois would be the administrative head, but I think she saw that I'd replaced, replaced her. So in any event, um, Janet was on hand, 
And she was a woman of great talent, knowledge of the Hill, she'd been around for a while, and also real administrative abilities. And she later life became Pamela Harriman's political. Uh, she devised the PAC that Pamela Harriman ran, and she ultimately ended up as the Senior Vice President for International Relations of Coca-Cola Company. And she was a remarkable uh, force and uh, undertake in terms of the processes of running this project. But in any event, um, John started about the processes of hiring lawyers and um, took him about two months to hire uh, what turned out to be approximately 40 of them. Uh, drove the committee, I think, crazy in a way because they couldn't see much was happening. Um, and I set about organizing a staff. And to a certain extent, it could have been and was chaotic when all of a sudden 40 lawyers uh, descend on a, in a project, essentially with nothing to do for a period of time, uh, need to get organized. And my responsibilities was to set up a administrative apparatus which included secretarial help, clerical help, and office um, details such as telephones, desks, et cetera. So I set about doing that um, with Janet's able assistance. And then I basically replicated the structure that I was familiar with at um, running projects um, for Ida. Um, and that meant, first of all, that I wanted somebody in charge of security. Now that I used as a euphemism because what I really had in mind, although it would be a somewhat grander title, was somebody who would function as a document control clerk in a intelligence setting. Um, so I set about hiring what I called a director of security and we put out an RFP, whatever you call it in the government, and we ended up with roughly a dozen applicants, all of whom were very qualified for major sorts of jobs because the title was security officer and of course it was a job that had a lot of sex appeal at that point in time. So there were about a dozen of them and I interviewed all of them one of them whom turned out is that when I finished with him, he flashed a badge. He was formerly with the CIA. And while he thought I would hire somebody with that sort of credential, um, eludes me. But in any event, I made a real 10 strike in terms of our security director, a fellow named Ben Marshall, who was a retired Air Force colonel, unmarried, important in terms of time and uh, required for the job. Since he was retired military, we had to get a sign off from the Speaker of the House to let him be in effect uh, double dipping in terms of a federal salary. But that was effectuated rather promptly. And uh, Ben joined us, hired somebody to work with him. And he understood exactly what I was looking for in terms of document control. And of course, fit in exactly what John had in mind because he was always um, very almost, uh, I mean, obsessed with confidentiality and security, particularly working in that type of arena. But Ben was somebody who could work, as he said, with our youngsters, most of whom were in their late 20s, early 30s at most, some maybe in their middle 20s, perhaps. And also he was able to be there essentially night and day when he was there in terms of controlling documents and we established a procedure of signing documents in and out with the library so that there would be a, they were numbered and the normal chronology, the sort of thing that's done in terms of a uh, intelligence operation, which I think comforted John a lot. And we also decided that um, 
the library where all of our documents were uh, stored um, needed some enhanced security. So we got somebody, um, a contracting company, to come in and um, reinforce the library, put screening on it, so in effect it was burglar proof. Um, and after all this was over, uh, John, who's always, uh, one, he's always got a friend that's an expert in something that he can put a finger on. Uh, and he likes to put a finger on somebody to make sure that in his mind, somebody he trusts. Um, so he got somebody by the name of Arnold Sagner, who I had never heard of, who apparently was somewhat in the security business. So Sagner came in and looked over all our processes, our procedures, the reinforcement of the library, and um, told me um, he was there for a day, that he was satisfied um, with what we'd set up in terms of security. <clears throat> so in any event, we ultimately ended up with a staff, including the lawyers, um, of about 100. Uh, and it was my job um, to handle everything that was required in terms of the administration of a group of people. Um, when, when, the, when John Doerr um, was able to get the materials from the Senate selected, Senate one of you. Right, that was Tom Bell. I doubt it. It doesn't make any difference. We treated it all the same. Um, our protocols would have been what you would use for classified materials. I don't recall that, um, that I had that conversation with Tom. Tom was the liaison, as you may recall, who uh, um, facilitated the transportation of that material over to the library. I should also say in a part of this, because Jeff, of course, had some piece of that. We established the procedure of uh, disposal of uh, confidential waste. Um, once or twice a day, uh, Jeff, with uh, this is one of our clerical people, with Ben Marshall, his assistant, would take the uh, waste that we considered to be confidential over to wherever the incinerator is and go through the guards and actually see the fires consume our materials and then report that had been duly uh, uh, destroyed. Um, so in answer to your question, that's a little bit of a digression, but it led me to another point. Um, I don't recall any of that was classified. And uh, when in March of 1974, when you received the bulging briefing right. with the tapes and the roadmap, um, you had already set up this document the document control system had been totally set up. And the um, processes of that, Maureen Barden, who, you, who was the head of our research library group, extremely talented, focused um, young woman. She had a group of, I guess, ended up to be 10 or 12. And she would have cataloged everything and numbered them and whatever. And so uh, documents would be checked in and out from the library as needed uh, by lawyers as they wanted to work on it. So that material from Tom Bell got from the Senate Select Committee would have simply been integrated into a lot of other documents that were already in the library. Uh, was there a need to know uh, system? I think um, initially, John was very fussy about that um, in terms of when the materials came over um, in the briefcase from the uh, Judge Sirica's chambers, and I think uh, I went with John over to get those materials and we brought them back. Uh, he was very particular initially about who could listen to the tapes. There were just a few people permitted. I think that the need to know um, became, the group became very bonded and cohesive in a very short order because it was, uh, 
like um, very intense and together and I don't think there was any need to have a need to know. Uh, I think there was total confidence. Even, and I hesitate to say this because you've gotten from others about the integrated staff with the minority and the majority and the way it worked is that they were, I really didn't even know who had picked which members of the group they worked in particular projects. There were a couple of big ones and then subsets and I didn't even know which um, minority had picked except for Garrison who of course was uh, the more partisan and became the uh, council in due course. Um, so I don't think there was ever any hesitation um, about leaks after a relatively short period of time, although we did follow those processes very carefully. And then um, we did have, um, all of us received over time letters from Jock Anderson and various wanted to know, we wanted to talk to him. So I would say that on a need to know basis, except at the beginning, uh, I don't think so. But I really don't know totally because that was up to Maureen and Ben Marshall. Well, the tapes are a long story, uh, and I'll start at the beginning. We initially got transcripts over of seven of the eight tapes. There were eight tapes that were subpoenaed. And we got transcripts for seven of them early in March. Transcripts for all but the April the 16th tape. And those were the same ones that the uh, Senate Select Committee had received also. Um, so we had transcripts for a short period of time before I went over with John to get the briefcase, which was March 27th. And John had told, um, I think it had been my sister's suggestion. John, John was of the view that he would kind of ruminate with his thoughts with some people that he trusted and knew well. And I had been, believe he'd been talking to Dorothy about when we got the tapes, we're gonna need to know how to play them. So somehow I got that information from Dor. I very rarely spoke to him, had much to do with him actually, um, that we needed to have the capacity to listen to these tapes when we got them. <coughs> so I am far from being a techie, I know it. And I knew it was going to be a significant um, project. So I was able to hire somebody who became very, very significant by the name of John Halverson, Bob Halverson, who had been the um, tapes consultant for many years for the Library of Congress. He was a man in his 50s. So when I got the word that this would be my responsibility, I checked around and through a friend of mine, happened on to Bob. So I talked to him and satisfied myself that um, he was eminently qualified and interested. So I hired him as a consultant and I said, Bob, what you need to do is when these tapes arrived in this office, you need to have machinery available that these eager beavers can jump on instantly to start listening to them. So when the tapes came over, he had, 
I don't know, several machines, four or five small machines available for listening. Uh, so they immediately started listening, again on, with John's uh, direction, limited number of people who were permitted to listen to them initially. So you, you were beginning, you were building this capability in anticipation that you would get from the grand jury these tapes? I knew we would get the tapes, and I had been told to be prepared to listen to them. So I had not just a tech, I had somebody who had um, real capacity. You developed a, a system not only for listening, but also for uh, duplicating. Well, this is a sequence. The tapes were of two types and two different qualities. The tapes which had been taken in the Oval Office, of which there were five, I think there's a mistake in the materials of the inquiry, but I'll come back to that. Five of the, ta five of the tapes had been recorded in the Oval Office, and these tapes were relatively, and I stress relatively, clear. Um, the tapes that came from the EOB was voice act activated, and the president would go over there on occasion to talk to various people, and the tapes recorded were run just when he spoke, were very, very unclear. Even so, the transcripts that came over, even of the Oval Office tapes, were very sketchy and didn't really tell a narrative. The EOB tapes were totally unintelligible. The transcripts had wide sections of unintelligible and blank spaces. So I was aware that the transcripts were considered inadequate by essentially everybody. And it wasn't too long that Bob came to me and he said, Bob, the tapes that we received from the special prosecutor were copied mic to mic. He said, you can't make much more out of them than the special counsel has done or the White House because the audio is so uh, garbled. He said, what we need to do is to get access to the originals. And if we do that, we can make tapes such that we can make clear transcripts of these meetings. So I very rarely went into CEDOR, but before, and, and so I went to Bernie Nussbaum, who was the head of our factual investigation. And I described the situation and I said, Bernie, I'm told that these tapes can be improved considerably if we can get access to the originals and make our own copies. I said, you need to go to John and tell him we have to have access to make adequate recordings. Whenever I tell this story, I always have to have a caveat because Bernie Nussbaum is a man of more than adequate ego. But he said to me, he said, Bob, you have more influence over Door than I have. I said, he said, you go. So I made an appointment to see him. And I went in and described the situation. Um, 
I told him about the recording was done mic to mic and we needed to get cording wire to wire. This was a subject he knew nothing about, nor had I. I don't know if he'd ever listened to any of the tapes, I doubt it. So he thought about it, um, always cautious. And so I emphasized it was really critical in order to prepare adequate transcripts. Tapes without transcripts that are accurate are not tapes. So he finally he said, I'll, I'll do it. So in any event, I went back to my business and several days elapsed. And Bernie came back to me and he said, Bob, what happened about the tapes? He said, you need to go see John again. So I went to see him again and I said, we really got to get access if you want to have good transcripts to deal with. And I told him about Bob Halverson and you know, he, he knew about all the un, unintelligible and he also knew from his own conversations with Ruth that there was a lots of unintelligible and that you meant to have people with good hearing. So he knew that the tapes were a mess. So in any event, I think I went two times, maybe three. And the third time he said, I've talked to Mr. St. Clair. And he said, you can go over, call him to make copies of the February 28th tape. So I had no idea where the idea of the February 28th tape came into view. First of all, it's an early on tape. It's only John Dean. It's not an important tape. It's an Oval Office tape, which means it was relatively easy to, relatively easy to get a transcript. But I said, fine. So Bob Halverson and I got our stuff, as I call it. In those days, recording equipment was stuff. And I called St. Clair and we went over, admitted to the EOB, and um, we were shown to a small little office in the executive office building. And after a while, I was summoned into Mr. St. Clair's office. And as I previously described it, it was baronial, a word I like to roll because our offices in the Congressional Office Building were uh, not baronial, far from it. A couple of couches, a couple of fireplaces. Uh, he's seated behind his desk, short man. He got up, came towards me. I'm not sure that he even shook my hand. I mean, there's clearly no small talk at all. And he said simply, Mr. Shelton, Mr. Shelton, I understand you're here to copy the February 28th tape. And I said, no, sir. I'm here to copy all of them. So in those moments, of course, time uh, stands still. Um, he looked at me, paused. I could see him thinking. Um, it wasn't a long time, but it wasn't a short time. But he finally, he nodded. He said, uh, very well, Mr. Shelton. He went back to his desk and I went back to our little office. And the first day we got one recording there all day long. The issue in part is I'm not sure that St. Clair had ever listened to the tapes. Later on in June, he hadn't listened to any of them. Bazart was in charge of the tapes. They were in a safe. He had total dom sole dominion over them. So Bazart had to get the tape, get the, get the amount that we were to have 
and have it brought to us. So we had one tape the first day. So I said to Bob at the end of the day, I said, we're going to leave our equipment here so they'll have to let us back in when we come tomorrow. So we were there for an entire week, I think like Monday through Friday, in which we got eight of the tapes recorded. Well, let me finish up with one little anecdote. Because at the end of our time, we got all of our, as I say, stuff. And we got out, I think it's the sort of corner of Pennsylvania Avenue at maybe 17th Street, where the EOB is. And it was rush hour, like on a Friday afternoon. And I was hell-bent that we were going to get back to the offices that evening. So at that point in time, they had what they called the shared ride in the District of Columbia with taxis. So I went out in the middle of Pennsylvania Avenue and stopped a taxi. Taxi stopped. And in the seat is uh, Dan Rather. I recognized him. So I didn't say, I said, I didn't address him by name. I just said, if you would be kind enough to move up into the front seat, my friend and I can be in the back seat. And if you'll hold on for just a moment, we have some stuff that we'd like to put in the trunk. So he went into the front seat. He was just going to the front door, I think, of the White House, just a short way. And uh, Somebody asked me one time, was he rude? He wasn't rude. He was annoyed, but um, he had no idea that we were trundling tapes back to the congressional office building. Uh, did you have to report this as an interaction with the journalist? Or was it like I'm not sure they had reporting requirements <laughs> in 74. We would bring them back in a briefcase, right? We brought them back every evening, what we had. We had a chess set. What did we do all day long? Halverson bought us a little chess set, and I still have it, a little box, a little portable step chess set. And we would sit there and wonder what was going to happen next or play a game of chess and wait for something to happen. But it, it took this long because it was real time. Well, no, uh, real time, and also um, Bizarre had to personally get every tape. We probably would only get one a day, sometimes maybe two. There were eight of them. Um, Did you interact personally with Fred Bizarre? Never saw him, ever. Some secretary would bring the uh, recording back to us. When we were finished, we'd give it up, wait again. And they gave you a small office in the EOB to do this? Tiny little office. Tiny little office. And we would go there and take up our post every morning at 8 or 8.30 and wait for something to happen. Um, I know it's been a long time, but are we talking about the first couple of weeks of April? I would say that probably we got the tapes March 27th. I think probably uh, early April is when Halverson would have said to me, we need to get the originals. That happened rather quickly. I'd say it probably took about 10 days or two weeks for John to get in touch with. Uh, now, my own view, I don't know if you've seen the statement of information that I wrote. If you haven't, I can. It was, it was to be sent down to the Nixon Library. I'm not sure it was. But in any event, John said to me, sent me a note later on note of appreciation, and he said, um, 
when I think how you, got his words, urged me to get the original tape and to get them transcribed, I'll be forever. Oh, oh uh, you urged me to get in touch with Judge Sirica. Now that, I think, is interesting and material because he didn't tell me he'd been in touch with Judge Sirica. He told me he'd been in touch with Mr. St. Clair. And my own view, knowing the dynamics of it, I think the fact that St. Clair agreed with the totality of it meant that it had been on the order of the judge. And I think the fact I'm going to come back and, 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 rem and, and, and give my own kind of impressionistic of how this has happened. My own view is, is that it was a little unusual. It was an ex parte communication with a judge, what a lawyer would say, that for John to be in touch with or indirectly with a judge, it could have been with his good friend Henry Ruth and the special author. But I do think that his note to me was accurate, that he'd been in touch with Judge Sirica, and thereafter it had happened with Mr. St. Clair. Uh, as a result of all these efforts, um, you had, I believe, some transcripts available to compare against the Nixon transcripts that came out on April 30th. Well, let me. This is another part of it. Is what did we do with the tapes once we had them? We set about doing our own transcripts, and I picked somebody named David Haynes, who was one of John's special assistants. Good Republican. Haynes Mills, his brother had been in the Eisenhower administration. He had formerly been a clerk for a Supreme Court Chief Justice. He was a friend of mine. Also, in my judgment, a uh, very anal personality. He wants somebody to listen to tapes all day long, struggling for words, it requires real perseverance, and he was interested in the job. So I asked David to do a whole revision of the transcripts we'd gotten from the White House and the special prosecutor. Special prosecutor's transcripts weren't any better than the White House transcripts, essentially the same. So David spent an entire week, eight or 10 hours a day, listening to tapes and revising the transcripts. And we had transcripts that were materially different. They sold a narrative. They weren't just little sketches of this and that. John was aware of that. I think he'd seen them, very happy about it. So I think he was gonna show off a little bit and it was decided we were gonna play the tapes with the new transcripts to the committee. By the time that had happened, I had discovered because of Halverson that even Haynes's tapes weren't the final word. So Haynes and Halverson and I had prepared another set of transcripts, which I call the Haynes revised transcripts. John being John wasn't confident in those because he thought that Halverson and I had been meddling with the whatever. He was confident in the Haynes tapes. So we had a hearing, all the committee, each had a recorder, each had transcripts, and we played over one of the tapes for him. It was interesting because right away, various members were raising their hands saying, I can hear additional words. So I discovered what I call the first of three principles for transcribing these things. 
Number one is the more you listen to these things with a transcript in front of you, is the more words you're going to hear. The second principle that I discovered, and I'll cover that, is people with ordinary hearing, it varies in terms of their hearing acuity. Before I got into the next section of it though, we hired somebody that Halverson knew who had been a NSA consultant for digging tape recordings from the Kremlin or whatever out of what they call the mud. This is, he was consultant for the NSA. He was a blind man that you may have heard other people mention. And he showed up and he was there for a day, spent the whole day, got a few more words out of the EOB tapes, not many, very labor intensive. So he was the one that suggested we buy all this high powered equipment to listen to these things. Wasn't much better than just an ordinary recorder. So in any event, once I discovered that people have difference in their hearing, I don't have particularly good hearing, I'm normal hearing, but not ultra the way Halverson did have unusually good hearing. We decided to have somebody else take a run at these transcripts. So we had an audition which was run by Halverson and we took volunteers and we tested on a group of the, one of the segments of the tape, what words they got out of it, testing their hearing. And we also made a judgment decision about whether we thought they would be interested in doing this type of work. So Halverson and I evaluated, we had 15 or 20 people. I think Miss, I think Hillary might have taken a crack at a listener, I'm not, I'm not sure about that because I didn't run the 15 or 20, Bob did. And we picked out one of the clerks, whose name was Jeff Bonchero. And Jeff had three of the characteristics that David Haynes had. One, he had very good ears. But two, he was clearly very persistent. I mean, you could tell that in, in terms of the test we gave, we had him write something out where the semicolons were right, the commons right. He was an anal personality. And he was very interested in doing the work. Much better work than taking the trash out to the incinerator once a day. So we picked him to try another run at our transcript. We're getting better and better, by the way. If you looked at the comparison, there's no difference. I mean, huge difference. I discovered a third principle. The one is that, they, that the more you listen and um, you get different words, which is the more you listen, you start hearing words that other people aren't gonna hear. So we established a basis that before we would change anything in our base transcripts, we'd have to have a panel of three people who could hear those words. And I think that the reliability, and Jeff spent hundreds of hours, by the way, I think he said that in his interview and the rest of us, Halverson was full time at this point in time. The members of Congress came over from the committee, a lot of them, to listen. And there was never one person to my knowledge that quibbled saying that our transcript was inaccurate in any way at the end of all this process. And um, Bill Weld says in his talk with you, um, grand jury transcripts, I mean, you can get into big arguments as whether transcripts are accurate or whatever. The members came in and many of them had listened to our tapes and transcripts and there was never any question about the reliability of what we had in those transcripts. Well, let me make a comment here, if I could, in terms of this whole process. 
I think in terms of history, and I think this is what is startling, at least in my course, I'm so close to it. Nixon fought tooth and nail to keep the tapes away from everybody. There is a episode called the Stennis Compromise, his first proposal when the tapes were, sub were subpoenaed by the special prosecutor, were to have summaries of the tapes authenticated by the probably somewhat senile and at least somewhat, he was quite aged at the time, Stennis. Not to send the tapes, but to send transcripts or the summaries of them. And Irvin bought off on this, but Cox did not. And that's what led to the Saturday Night Massacre. So I think what history, you know, historians that come after you and me when they really want to get up into the sort of, how shall I put it, the context of this whole process, is Nixon actually didn't send the tapes. It appears what he sent were defective tapes. And he sent them to the special prosecutor and the special prosecutor sent them to us. So it's not just the fact that the transcripts were inadequate or inaccurate. He sent defective tapes. And I think that's a fact that's startling in terms of the way historians have written up this episode. Um, so I leave that with you. You're a presidential historian. Maybe Woodward and Bernstein would like to have a crack at that some point in time. Well, the implication, of course, is that this was a knowing obstruction by the president. I think that it's, when, I, when, I, when you put the pieces all together, one, how he fought tooth and nail not to handle over the tapes. He, you know, he, he, he fired Cox rather than do that. That's how much he cared about not sending over the tapes. Well, and we saw, and what's interesting also, is that the April 30th tape, transcripts, when it was, he responded, the president responded to the subpoena from the House, from the Judiciary Committee, his response was again a transcript compromise. Exactly. Well, let me comment. My sister, this was Renata Adler's suggestion, as I understand it, who was sort of a consultant to Dorr. She thought that there clearly had been some changes in the transcripts, the way they were sent over. And Dorothy did a comparison, which I think you've seen. And it's not only their great big unintelligible blanks that are put in. There was clearly some intentional changes in the wording. So I think that it stands to reason that if he just sent the transcripts and wasn't have the tapes, who would know? So I think this, I mean, to me, and I've never, it, it was a part of, of the routine, and I don't think this has been something. When people talk about the tapes, as you know, Alexander Butterfield said the tapes and everything, you know, the sun shone. The fact of the matter is, is that I think there, there is one, as, as the lawyers would say, one chain missing in, this, in the sequence is did we get the originals that came from the special prosecutor or did he make bad copies? And my own view is that we either got the originals that the White House sent over or he made copies of bad copies. Um, when uh, on the 29th, Right. But he would be permitting Rosino and Hutchinson, Hutchinson was the ranking member um, of the minority, um, to come over and listen to the originals. Same, same idea. It, uh, same as the standards. Same idea, same Do idea. Do you recall being brought in at all on, uh, because uh, the subpoena doesn't go out, the, 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 the rejection uh, 
doesn't go out until May 1st. Did, were you, had you talked to either Rubino or? No, 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 but, no but it was well known among everybody in the staff by April 29th that the transcripts that the White House sent over were not only inadequate but inaccurate. Oh, just to clarify this for those watching, you had received White House transcripts already because the, the famous blue book doesn't come out until the 30th of April. That's correct, but we got transcripts uh, early in March. Now there's one footnote that I want to put in here. I which just want, before we get to <laughs> those transcripts that came over with the bulging briefcase, Correct. And made by whom? Those transcripts were made by the White House. There were two sets of transcripts that came over. One were the White House transcripts, but then the special prosecutor had tried to do their own, which I've said were not materially any better. But those came over with the bulging briefcase. That's correct. That's the question. So you had already the White House's first crack at transcripts for these days, which were already bad. Right. So you already knew that whatever they gave you on April 30th was not likely to be much better. We had already done by mid-April, I'm thinking in terms of the chronology, we had already gotten the tapes and done our first crack at, 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 at showing that they were inaccurate by that point in time. One little footnote here is not gonna interest your audience at all. The first group that came over were not eight, they were seven. And the April the 16th tape was not included in that first batch that we got, but it was included in the April 30th batch. There's one other point that I want to mention just in terms of a footnote. We got more of the March 22nd tape that we were entitled to. If you look at the comparison of the transcripts, there is a whole section where there's no comparison. And one piece of that is very material because it's that one part where the president says, don't let it hang out, do what's required to bury this thing in effect. That part was never in the transcript and that we obtained actually by accident. And it was really part of the, it was a, a very important piece of the, of, of the material that we got. So I'm only making that point in terms of historians is when they see the comparison of the transcripts, you're gonna see this part sticking out on March 22nd. And that's the part that we got that was inadvertently given to us by Bazart and turned out to be quite material. Um, and they did not include that in the blue book. Correct, correct. Um, one, other, one, other <laughs> one other final footnote. I think that I'd make, I'm not only for your viewers, but also historians, and I happen to have a unique. I think there's an error in the material that came over that's in the, um, in, the, in, the, in the work that the impeachment inquiry staff did. They labeled the April the 16th as being an Oval Office tape. I think it was an EOB tape. One, it's totally unintelligible. Two, it was done in the afternoon. Um, and three, I'd always heard that there were five and three. And so that matches up the numbers of five and three. But I do think that April the 16th tape uh, is an EOB tape for those reasons. Here again, just for some historian that comes after you. And um, do, do you ever interact with Chairman Rodino? Never. Actually, I interacted with Mr. Jenner a fair amount. Um, and I think, the, I think this is an interesting point. Mr. Jenner was never an employee of the inquiry staff. He always was a consultant. He didn't give up his partnership at Jenner and Block. And um, he would come to town periodically. And um, Very convivial gentleman. Uh, I had lunch with him a couple times in the Metropolitan Club. Uh, good lawyer. Uh, not deeply involved in the work of the inquiry staff. And not a partisan. He bought into the uh, uh, 
part that it was a fact-finding expedition and not a, uh, up to him to be a partisan. Garrison did, of course, uh, later on, but uh, he supported John, which was crucial. Mr. Bur Mr. Jenner, um, Hutchison later described him to his group as somewhat of a dilettante, and I think that's not totally inaccurate with respect to the work that he did. But his job was to be supportive, which he was 100%, not of John, but of the process, the process of looking at the material, analyzing it, and presenting it. So and I, I have the utmost respect for Mr. Jenner, uh, and I think the part that he did was invaluable. Uh, did you interact uh, with any of the elected members? I know uh, Congressman then Sarbanes somewhat, but I never said anything to him at that period, during that period of time. I don't believe there were any leaks that came from the inquiry staff for the reasons I've stated in detail. But let me also make another point here in terms of the processes, the document control. We got piles of resumes of people that wanted to work for the inquiry staff. A pile of them made onto my desk, which I paid absolutely no attention to. Because if you look at the staff, there is a one lawyer who is a congressional staffer or involved in the political world. They were all selected by good friends of Doerr like Judge Johnson or Burt Marshall as people who would be reliable, conscientious um, performers. Um, so I think a part of it, I, I think the processes and the, and the emphasis on it, confidentiality is important, but the real key to it is the sort of people that were involved um, in the undertaking. Uh, what role did you play in, in piecing together the state, statements of information? Well, let me, let me um, back up a little bit. I had told Dorr that I would sign on for four months. And I started essentially January 3rd, and so my four months were up in January, one, end of April. And I meant it because I was, you might say, a reluctant warrior, as I've described. But I stayed on until I was satisfied that everything was in order, that the transcripts were completed, that the administrative apparatus was functioning smoothly. Um, and once I was satisfied that that was the case, I went in and I said to him that um, I thought it was time for me to go. And he wasn't happy about it, but he agreed. He asked if I would come back if I was needed, and I said, of course. And I did come back when we prepared to make a presentation to the entire Congress. Um, Bob Halverson, got, we, we, we produced about 100 listening machines that we had in a great big auditorium somewhere, all ready for the congressmen all to come in and listen to them. They never did, but we were ready for that. And I did come back for a couple of days, and I might have, um, I might have had some fine tuning of the apparatus that needed taken care of. Let me let me also the presentation. Went on for some time. It, it, I think it drove the members crazy, but there there you have it. The process of getting those 47 volumes together with 38 copies 
by the old-fashioned Xeroxing that we had and putting them in volumes and to get them, it was every night to do that so they'd be available the next morning. And here again, it was Janet Howard and Maureen Barden that did that really Herculean task. And it's barely administrative, but it was crucial. And I remember, I think Maureen said in her note that when the first day went off without a hitch and there were 40 volumes and there wasn't a page out of place, well, that was Maureen's doing and Janet's doing, uh, not mine. Let me go back to something you just back briefly to set up the listening arrangements for the entire house. I assume we're talking about that very brief period from the passage of the three articles through the president's resignation when it, when it appeared at that point that, that the three articles of impeachment would go to the entire house. Probably. other than the eight. You also received a tape of tapes, I believe. You, there were other tapes that you received eventually. Right. Um, those came in, do you, do you remember when they came in? They didn't come March 27th. I don't know when that came in. And I'm not sure I was still there when it came in. Um, and I assume we did our own transcript of that. So that's the tape from June of... Correct, June 4, right. That came in after the uh, court decision. I'm not sure when it well, it was, I, I think it was a tape offered. The White House did offer some tapes that were not subpoenaed. Uh, um, yeah. Tapes that were helpful to the president. Yeah, and I, <laughs> I guess we didn't, pa didn't pay as much attention to getting every word correct on those. You know, I, and, I, and I kind of, um, I don't know if it's an anecdote or story, but it, but it was material. Early on, um, you notice, you say in terms of, 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 of my work, I would say I did this or I did that. Did it occur to you whether I was, anybody was paying any attention to what I was doing? Um, <laughs> in any event, early on, um, John and I, John is, is, is a control guy, and I think that's, I can't tell you what he did in terms of this process was a tour de force, he, he and Wardino. I think the fact of the matter is, is, is that they, they were somehow able to set the table so that the people who were not partisan could come to a decision of what the right thing to do. And to do that was a combination of very subtle, some not so subtle factors, and they were continuous. And I think this, his ability and his fact that he was able to do that with Rodino was ultimately responsible uh, for, for, the, for the outcome. But he was a mother may I kind of control guy. And very early on, and I, Uh, and I don't want to want to uh, overemphasize this, but I think I made it very clear that I would run the administration, and I did, and he came to be very happy with that. And he had plenty to do in his part of the world. And I think that made for a very harmonious relationship uh, in terms of uh, the outcome. Besides learning all about tech things that you that you didn't know about before, um, 
surprises that I You know, it's it's um, my reactions. You've you've talked to a dozen, maybe a dozen and a half people who were involved. Who I twenty, who were much more excited about this than I was. I was to me, what I did. I was asked to do a job, and I did it. And it was, it was, it was, I've heard you, this, it was tough work. It was seven days a week. Uh, I didn't do the, um, you know, the wee hours of the morning, but rarely, but it, it, was, it was an undertaking. But to me, it was something that I needed to do was happy to do, and I did it. I didn't really have the um, excitement that I think maybe some of the people that you've talked to had. Um, but you must have. You did have a eureka moment or two when you saw the difference. Well, you, well, well, you know, well, you, you know to, to me, the eureka moment was when I said to Mr. St. Clair, I'm going to copy all of them. And then I knew that from then it was all downhill. Well, that, uh, no wish to quibble, but that was also, that was, that was a bit of self-possession. Because you, it was a good thing, but you were doing, you went beyond your brief. Well, you know, you haven't asked something, which I think is, is, is um, interesting. If did I intend to do that? And maybe subliminally I intended to do that because I was very unhappy about it. And you see, here again it indicates the, the, the desire to keep control of the tapes and not the transcripts. You see, this was to be a test case, and it's not a good test case. It's an inconsequential tape, and it's an Oval Office tape. So I thought it was kind of a setup, and it didn't make any sense to me. And so John said to me, you can have the February 28th tape. I didn't say that makes no sense at all. I just said, all right. So in any event, I was not happy about it. And um, I didn't think it was going to get us anywhere. And I didn't know, you know, I mean, the president had a history of diddling. And how long does that go? So I hadn't, hadn't decided to do anything because I was... I was not going to be insubordinate. I didn't plan to be insubordinate, you might put that way. But when he came out here and he said, Mr. Shelton, you come here, and I said, it just popped into my head. And I said firmly, no, sir. And that was really the only, you know, to, to me the rest of it was, was you know, having, I mean, the, the press is around the whole time going over. When I went over to, actually, it was interesting, and we haven't focused on that, is I went over with John and um, um, Joe Woods to pick up the briefcase from Sirica, which um, John was in with the judge, and I guess Joe Woods was too, and the clerk and I inventoried everything. It wasn't that much, really. And um, then, as I say, he in his inimitable style, uh, put it in an old brown government briefcase and slouched back onto the taxi. But uh, for me, that was, that was pretty exciting. There were hundreds of reporters and in front page in the New York Times the next day. And so the briefcase, the briefcase came from John Doerr? Oh, that was John's briefcase. So it was an old, probably an old civil rights briefcase. I mean, it was a crummy old thing. I mean, you've seen pictures, you know, on the, it was in the front page of the everything, probably Time Magazine, and there he is, uh, sort of a John Wayne figure, you know, always a little slouched, and he's got the briefcase. He was coming into the Congressional Office Building, and then Joe Woods is right behind him, and then right behind him is me, um, and hundreds of reporters snapping away, and you know, getting the briefcase was, you know, that was that was the, that was the 
smoking gun in a way, the, the way the world looked at it. How long did it take for you to realize that you might have received more of the March 22nd tape than you were supposed to? Well, Joe, actually, I interacted, as I've indicated, I very rarely ever talked to Dorr. You know, there was always a big queue out there and whatnot. And I think that Joe, Joe Woods kind of, I was friendly with Joe and I was friendly with Nussbaum in terms of, of daily interaction. Joe was the head of the um, facts of the legal group and he had a unique relationship with Dorr because they'd been school dates based together in, in law school. So he had really a, a personal relationship and dealt with him in a completely different way than maybe some of the rest of us did. And Joe kept track of what I was doing um, and I think probably would tell Dora about it. So when I came back with a March 22nd tape, he said to me, you got more than you were entitled to from the tapes. And then he said something I remember very clearly. He says, it just shows with all of these recordings, if you, no matter where you dip into, you know, we had certain little focus, wherever you dip into it, you're gonna find something. I don't think you're gonna find something like you found the tail end of the March 22nd tape. But any of it, Joe said to me, and I, I didn't, um, you know, I treated my job kind of as a journeyman. My job was to get the tapes, get the transcripts, and make sure they were right. And I didn't really get involved in the politics or the policy or In the morning. Um, John Doerr knew something about that tape before you received it. Did you know when, when, when you were anticipating uh, that the tape would come, you were preparing for the tape to come, did you know that people were anticipating hearing the March 21st answer on the presidency? Tape? Did, you, did you heard about it? I had not. We got the transcripts. You know, there, there's also a piece of it. John was in touch. He had a good friend in the special prosecutor's office, Henry Ruth, who you've mentioned and know. And I think John and Ruth were um, in contact from time to time. The interesting thing about the March 21 tape, of course, it's after that that the 75, that, that afternoon, the $75,000 is handed over to Hunt. So that ties things together in a way that's, that's, that's very material. Um, I, I, I knew nothing about what was on that tape or ahead of time. And, and also John, um, when I, he didn't want a lot of discussion in the hallways drinking about those tapes initially. Um, he, he, he was very circumspect about what he knew and, and, and what was, was on those recordings. Um, what, uh, what did you take away from this saga in terms of your understanding of the future? Well, you know, there's, uh, of course, um, I think the commentators, and I listen to them, who doesn't, in terms of the current situation, I think many of them and there are loads of them, are somewhat informed. First of all, you have the issue of whether it has anything to do with a, a crime per se. And the issue is not so much John's view. I think the better view is, here's why again the, the Clinton situation was totally different. It has to, impeach, high crimes and misdemeanors has to do with, with something that involves the state. You know, it's a crime against the state. It's not something that's it's personal, I mean, it's not you know, a, a, a perjury sort of thing. So I think, I think that, the, that the commentators are getting it wrong in a way. Actually, the, 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 the committee could never get together in terms of, they, have an, a, 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 they had a, a memorandum on what constitutes it. They, they never came up with a real definition. 
they left it up to the committee members to decide in their own minds, just give it context. And I think the reason for that is it really is ultimately a political decision in some way. It's a, it's, it's a, it's a hybrid. So what, 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 what I find in terms of, of, of what, I, what I see in, in, in the current, current context is you don't find the commentators, of course, putting that context around it. The other thing that I think that they get completely wrong is they think that if there are Republicans in the House of Representatives, they'll vote one way. And if there's a Democratic House, they'll vote another way. What I learned in terms of the way the process works, and here I think it was part of the brilliance of John and Rodino, and to some extent, Burt Jenner, of course, is, is that they slowed the process down and made the committee and the country look at it for months and months. And so the curve of change, you know, mathematicians have what they call the curve of change. The curve of change goes like this, and then it starts bending upwards. So when you have a period of time where people are looking at a problem and analyzing it and thinking about it, it gets a certain momentum to it. And what I found that was very interesting that I thought that Dorr counted on and ultimately proved to be the case is when these lawyers who are sworn to uphold the law and the Constitution is when it was put to them such a large percentage of what would have been the minority party voted for three articles of impeachment. And um, Dick Gill tells a story, which I think is a great story about the minority. He said he happened to be involved with um, uh, Mr. Fish, whose family goes back to Representative Fish, upper New York State, goes back to Abraham Lincoln in terms of its Republican credentials. And he was being lectured by one of, the, uh, one of the minority members of the House as to what he should do as a Republican. And Dick says he rose to his six feet four inches and he said, don't presume to tell me what it means to be a Republican. And I do think that what you saw at the end of the day by seven, six Republicans is over time there were some partisans that remained, but at the end of it, the middle held. And I think that in terms of our times, some of the commentators really missed that point. Bob, thank you very much for your time today. A pleasure. I'm very happy that your reflections are now part of the collection. Well, I hope they'll be helpful.